Hi everyone, this is Ranjit, back with another video. The topic for this video is an algorithm to compute minimum bounding circles and spheres. I also have some updates related to the Geom Algolib project. I will talk more about that at the end of the video. First, consider this question. Say you have a set of radio receivers located at random positions. Your task is to figure out where to position the transmitter such that you deliver the strongest signal possible to the farthest receiver. The case may be that you are trying to save money on the transmitter, so if you can find this ideal position, you might be able to get away with using a low power transmitter. So how do you figure out where this ideal position is? If you draw a circle with your transmitter as its center and the distance to the farthest receiver as the radius, you want the circle to be as small as possible. And by definition, because the circle passes through the farthest point, every other point must be inside this circle. That means if you can find the smallest circle that contains all the receiver locations, the center of that circle is the ideal position for your transmitter. I sometimes like visualizing things as fields to get a feel for them. In this field, the blue areas are optimal locations for our transmitter. This is what the field looks like for the same problem in 3D. In 3D, you're trying to find the minimum bounding sphere, and obviously the field is three-dimensional. You are just seeing a cross-section of that field on the screen. Now, keep in mind that this field is only for visualization purposes. As tempting as it might be to simply look for the bluest spot on the field and call it a day, we can do a lot better. The algorithm I will explain later will be more precise and will find the solution a lot quicker. Now, I want to switch back to the demo from earlier. We had this circle centered at the transmitter's location and with radius equal to the distance to the farthest receiver. Even when we minimize the radius of the circle by manually moving the transmitter around, keep in mind the fact that the circle will always pass through the farthest point. That's also true for the minimum bounding circle it will always pass through the farthest point. That's the first thing I want you to remember before we get into the algorithm. The second thing I want you to remember is the fact that not only will the minimum bounding circle pass through the farthest points, it will always pass through more than one point. It will pass through two or more points that are equally far from the transmitter. This is because if you have a circle that passes through a single farthest point, that means there's still room for the circle to shrink. It can pass through at most three points, of course, you can have a circle passing through more than three points, but you can still compute that circle as a circumcircle of any three of those points. With those two observations, let's jump into the algorithm. I will go over the algorithm by stepping through the code and simultaneously visualizing the geometry. The first thing we do is to check to make sure we have at least two points because it's not very meaningful to find the smallest bounding circle for a single point. In this example, we have five points, so we proceed without complaining. We then instantiate a default circle and pass it by reference to this function, which is the implementation of the algorithm. Let's step into that. If you look at the signature of this function, in addition to a reference to a circle, it also takes a range of points defined by the begin and end iterators. In this case, they are just ordinary pointers. You can of course see the actual points and their indices on the left. There are two more optional arguments called pin one and pin two. I will explain what they are in a moment. Let's proceed for now knowing that they are both set to null pointers by default. Now, earlier I asked you to remember that the minimum bounding circle will pass through either two or three points. If we know what those points are, we could have just constructed the circle directly, but we don't know what those points are. So we're going to make a naive guess, knowing full well that it's probably not correct, and refine our answer until we get to the actual solution. I'm going to pick the first two points in the range and naively assume that they are the two farthest points from the ideal transmitter position. So based on this assumption, these two points define the diameter of the circle. So we construct that circle. Now let's go over the rest of the points in our range and see if our assumption is correct. The next point in the range has index two and that is clearly inside the circle. So we don't do anything about it and just move on to the next point. But the point with index three is not inside the circle. We had assumed that points zero and one are the farthest from the ideal transmitter position, but point three is clearly outside that circle. So let's refine our assumption by saying that three is the farthest point from the ideal transmitter position. That means the circle must pass through this point, but that's not enough information for us to construct a new circle. We need at least two, if not three points to construct a circle that passes through them. 
So let's go back to the beginning and search for another candidate for the circle to pass through among the points that we already visited. To remember that the circle must pass through point three, let's put a pin on that point. We do this by passing it as the pin one argument to our recursive function call. Let's step inside this function call. Now we are back at the beginning of the same function, but this time pin one is not a null pointer. So we know that whatever circle we create must pass through that pin. Once again, we are going to be naive and assume that the other farthest point from our transmitter position is the first point in our range. Let's check if our guess is correct by iterating over the remaining points. Right away, point number one is not inside the circle. This must mean that point one is one of the farthest points from the ideal transmitter position. So let's put our second pin on point one and make yet another recursive call to the same function. We are once again at the beginning of this function, but this time both pin one and pin two are set. So we don't have to guess anything. We create a circle with the two pins as the ends of its diameter. Let's check if the circle contains all the points we already visited. Right away, point zero is not inside the circle. This must mean that there are three farthest points from the ideal transmitter position and zero must be one of them. Until now, we've been setting pins and recursing deeper because we didn't have enough points to construct a circle, but now we have three points that lie on the circle. So we don't have to set any more pins. We can just construct the circumcircle that passes through points zero, one, and three. We then step out of the recursive function call. That means we don't have a pin on point one anymore. We still have a pin on point three. As we iterate through the rest of the points, all points from zero to three are either inside or on the circle. So we step out of this level of recursion. If we only had points zero to three to worry about, we'd stop here because we already found the minimum bounding circle for those points, but we're not done yet. Now we get to point four. It's not inside the circle. And we are going to do the same thing that we've been doing so far. We will set the first pin on point four, recurse deeper, and then set the second pin if necessary. If we ever get to three pins, we will create a circumcircle using those three pins and step out of the recursion. By following this method, we will end up with the smallest circle that contains point four as well as all the other points before it. That is the solution. That is the minimum bounding circle we've been after. Now you might be concerned about the performance of this algorithm given the fact that we use recursion, but keep in mind that we never recurse more than two levels deep. More importantly, we only recurse when we encounter a point that is outside the circle. That means the performance of the algorithm depends on the order of the points. Because if we have a relatively large circle quite early during the algorithm, we won't need as much recursion. That means in the best case scenario, the performance can be close to linear. If your points are ordered such that you start out in the middle and slowly radiate outwards, that is the worst possible case in terms of performance because you are growing the circle slowly in incremental steps and you might need two levels of recursion for each one of those steps. And yeah, that's not good. And given that we don't know how the points are distributed, we might be better off just shuffling all the points to end up with a random order. Another strategy for optimizing performance is to use convex hulls. The idea being that the points farthest from the ideal transmitter position must lie on the convex hull of that point set. So if you can get rid of all the points that are not on the convex hull and run the minimum bounding circle on the vertices of the convex hull, you'd have fewer points to process and the algorithm should be quicker. So if you already know the convex hull of the points, you should probably use that. I have a unit test that runs the algorithm for lots of different random point clouds and prints the average time it takes to compute the minimum bounding circle for a given number of random points. This is the plot of those times. On the x-axis you have the number of points and on the y-axis you have the time in milliseconds. The relationship seems to be linear and I am happy with this performance. You can use the same algorithm to find minimum bounding spheres in 3D. The difference being in 3D, you can have a unique sphere defined by four points. That means you might need one more pin than you would in two dimensions. And consequently, you might need to recurse one level deeper than in two dimensions. I have this short demo that creates a random point cloud. You can control the number of points with a slider and it calculates the minimum bounding circle. And as you can see, it works as expected. I have a similar demo in 3D that computes the minimum bounding spheres and 
that too works as you'd expect. That brings this video to an end, almost. Because as promised, I do have some updates related to the code base and the project. First update, I renamed the project and the GitHub repository. It's now called Gal Project. I shortened geometry algorithm library to Gal. I've been working on the application quite a bit over the last three months, adding lots of new features. The main purpose of this code base is to support making tutorials as well as serve as a repository for, for algorithms covered in the videos. One of the features I added is the ability to visualize the geometry stored in variables in real time as you are debugging and stepping through the code. Earlier when I was stepping through the code and showing the corresponding geometry on the left at the same time, it was not post-processing. It was actually happening in real time. These gal capture macros that you see across the code, they serialize the variables and write them to files on the disk. And I have an instance of CalView running in another window monitoring that folder and rendering the geometry corresponding to the variables. I think this feature is useful for understanding the algorithms and understanding exactly what the code is doing to the geometry. It's helpful for finding and fixing bugs and it's also useful for making videos. And I like doing it this way because I don't want to write code with the sole purpose of producing videos because unrelated to the videos I produce, the code you see on the screen is still efficient C++ code that you can use for something else. The Gal Capture macros only work in debug mode. So if you compile this code in release mode, the Gal Capture macros will disappear and you'll have like an efficient C++ program. So that concludes this video. And as always, you can find all the links in the description. The algorithm itself is originally from the book titled Computational Geometry Algorithms and Applications. It's also linked in the description. So with that, uh, thank you for watching this video and see you in the next one.